Aloha, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another um, weekly Condo Insider. Today, I have with me the wonderful Lalan with, um, she's an attorney, and she specialized, she was part of her um, role is handling some um, condo foreclosures. So welcome, and um, give us a little one minute update on, on, on what you do and the, and the attorney from that you're with, Damon Kapchak and something. <laughs> Thank you, Riley. Aloha, everybody. Uh, my name is Nalan. I'm a director with a law firm, Demin Key Leon Kapcha Custard. I practice condominium community association law. Uh, so as Riley just mentioned, a part of our practice is assisting associations to foreclose on their statutory lien for unpaid assessments. So let's start off like, um, because this has always been a, a conversation that um, some people, or you know, a list of questions that people have asked, is when a um, a unit owner becomes delinquent, um, you know, usually typically the association should have already in place a um, collection process. So, like, do they wait sixty days, ninety days, or one hundred twenty days before they send it to legal? But they should have an established policy and procedure um, for sending it uh, for collections, right? Yes. So um, what so the big part is once it goes to collection, the attorneys have their um, they follow the debt collection procedures act. And so they go through their steps for collection. Can you give a just a brief um, little snippet of what that collection process would entail? Yes. So for starter, of course, uh, usually the association would, uh, the attorney would first review the file to see, you know, the prior courtesy reminder, and maybe the first three letters sent from the association's managing agent to the owners, verify, you know, if the person identified is the uh, owner of record and do some due diligence on the owner to see if there's any, uh, let's see, bankruptcy filing that would be subject to automatic stay, or if the owner is on mil active, active military status, that would special rights would apply to so those debtors, uh, you know, and then, you know, uh, if there's any bounce back from the address the association previously tried to communicate with the owner. And it, of course, if the address is wrong, then uh, attorneys usually will do uh, skip trace or just using some other avenues to try to locate where the owners are. The first step usually start with a fair debt notice letter, uh, which is subject to the requirements of uh, the federal law um, as a debt collector, what notices, what information need to be provided in that initial notice uh, that usually gives a period of time for debtors to dispute the debt. Uh, if not, sometimes, you know, owners been good if this went to legal, they would pay off. But sometimes they would reach out to try to work out payment plans. But sometimes there are owners who are really facing financial difficulty. They cannot pay off. They are also taking no action, not, uh, you know, contacting back. Uh, Usually, the next step, uh, attorney was would recommend the association consider placing a lien. Although there is a statutory lien automatic in place, uh, usually uh, attorneys would recommend the board to record a lien because in the lien world, as we all know, it's uh, first in time, first in right. So recording it uh, that would give you. Um, advantage as a priority wise to other credit debtors out there. Uh, afterwards, you know, if this is, let's see, an owner occupant, sometimes there's also special avenues the association can try, like a rent collection policy or termination of uh, certain common amenity services provided by the association if the association has adopted such policies with majority approval of unit owners. Uh, if not, then there's usually ways uh, you know, they would consider taking it to the next step. If somehow, you know, there's no response from owner, there's no payment plan, there's nothing that they would consider either filing a district court action to get a personal judgment, or they would consider foreclosing on the lien. That would lead to our discussion today, foreclosure. And then um, I want to also make it clear that um, with HRS 514B, um, statute number 41, 144 and 146, there's no way an owner can say, well, I'm not paying the maintenance fee because I don't like the way it's being maintained. I mean, that is not an excuse. They signed their, um, when they purchase it, they signed an agreement, you know, with the house rules in place. So just because they don't like something is not an excuse or a reason 
to not pay make their maintenance fees correct that's correct there's a statutory provision that clearly say a unit owner cannot withhold from paying such uh you know assessment because once you bought into this unit uh, you as a unit owner obligated to pay for your share of the you know common expenses and uh, there's uh you know the whole 514b section 146 uh, dictates on how such unpaid amounts the association automatically get a statutory lien. okay so um just to kind of recap so when it goes to the attorney then they're going to go through their procedures following the debt collection procedures act they're going to check to see if they're what the what the liens are on the property because there could be government liens right for um, real property tax and paid amounts yes right yeah. so they need to check what what is attached to the property already um also identifying who the um recorded um owners of the property are right yes. and then they would send a letter to all owners of record at that time right um and do they notify the, the current or the existing lien holders of any kind that, of action being taken? Uh, that usually, uh, if you know, if you're trying to do, let's see, uh, rent collection or termination of utility or common amenities, there's a requirement. You also need to give notice to the first lien, uh, first mortgage lien holder. Uh, you know, usually, of course, there's judicial foreclosure, which you need to go to court. There's also non-judicial foreclosure, you know, which is the power of sale process. Both of these processes, uh, you will need to uh, basically serve uh, all parties that has an interest in this property. Uh, you know, that would include uh, mortgage lien holders, uh, you know, if there's, of course, unpaid real property taxes in the government, so the, the city, and then, um, you know, if there's other judgment creditor that has recorded lien, that, of course, and then unit owners, that's for sure. Uh, so, Definitely, the notice process will be triggered once you, you decide to go into that process. And then let's talk about the filing of the list pendants. What exactly is that? So for judicial foreclosure, at the moment when you file for the complaint, uh, there is, you know, a, usually it's called, also called a notice of pendants of action. In Hawaii, it's also referred as the legal term is a lease pendants. At the same time, you file that NOPA in court. Uh, once upon filing, you can record that uh, in the bureau. So that gives, uh, you know, third party, the public notices that, you know, there is this uh, action where the lien holder is, uh, in the process of starting to foreclose on the lien. Uh, so whoever, e either they want to buy this property or they want to refinance or uh, do something on this property, they are going to get notice of, of this. So they realize, you know, they need to take care of this before they can get a clean title. Right. And then um, I know um, there's been a lot of um, court action regarding the non-judicial foreclosures, but what's what's the status now the legal status now with non-judicial foreclosures for associations uh, there is new section you know part six of the chapter 667 of hawaii revised statute uh we're called you know this is the current procedure the associations has been following to conduct non-judicial foreclosures of course uh there were you know disputes litigation on the old chapter of the non-judicial process. I think that's beyond today's topic. Uh, we're just going to be focusing on part six of chapter 667. If the association opts to do non-judicial foreclosure, then that's the process, the procedure steps they need to follow. But of course, you know, the statute also made it clear if an owner's delinquency uh, rose from or includes only fines, legal fees, and costs, you cannot use non-judicial foreclosure to uh, foreclose on that lien. You can do it by judicial foreclosure, but not for power of sale of foreclosure. Okay, so in the debt collection process, um, what role does the attorney take in trying to collect the collect the debt? Do they um in I mean they make every attempt to communicate with the with the unit owner. Um, do they try to establish uh, uh, like a payment plan or put them into a payment plan of some sort? 
Yes, uh, for both, uh, you know, the, the statute gives uh, basically when you try to start the foreclosure process, you start with a notice of default, intent to foreclose, and then the statute imposes a 60 day waiting period of time that would give time for debtor to consult with the credit consulting or, uh, you know, uh, budget consulting or some sometimes they would even consult with the bankruptcy attorneys uh, or they give them time to work out a payment plan. Uh, you know, with the, uh, the association, uh, within this 60 days, you're not supposed to proceed further. You're supposed to wait and give debtor the opportunity to work things out. And they always have a right to propose a payment plan proposal. Uh, usually a reasonable payment plan, uh, you know, under the statute, it will be defined as uh, if they keep paying the current dues and then they can come up with a plan that would pay off the debt owed within a year. Uh, 12 months. So then that should be considered a reasonable plan. The association is supposed to work with the, uh, the owner to accept the payment plan proposal monitor and put a hold on the foreclosure process. Oh, so say they owe like $5,000 in back maintenance fees. So they would have to pay the current month plus apply extra money toward their, their oh, debt owed. Oh, yes. Wow. Okay. So, because uh, I remember way back when, sometimes they would they would accept like twenty five dollars a month, you know, for for only a certain amount of time, not forever, but for right. a certain amount of time. Of course, that's the just the statutory definition. You know, the board always have authority. You know, if they think this owner has been behaving well, uh, the owners there's unique circumstances presenting. They want to give the owner some additional time. You know, if the board approves, you know, a payment plan that would cure the default within two years, that that would also be acceptable. Usually the attorney is just the messenger there. You know, they would pass on this proposal for the board to approve review. Uh, so that's how it usually works. Um, so what would be your favorite or your, your most widely um, professional um, tips to condos, to the board on setting up their debt collection procedures? Uh, definitely, I mean, each association has their own legal counsel. You know, I think before you finalize that policy, you know, that policy could be adopted like many, many years ago when the statute are different. So if it's been a while, it's always a good idea to consult with your counsel to try to update, make sure it's in compliance with the current applicable law. For example, you know, right now there's also a mediation process, you know, after you start the foreclosure process, if the owner uh, wants to initiate a foreclosure, uh, initiate a mediation process within 30 days upon service, then, you know, association should also pause the non-judicial foreclosure and go into mediation with owners. There are all kinds of, uh, you know, new laws also regarding, um, uh, you know, the, the process, how it works, uh, the publication requirements, you know, before and now they're all very different. So definitely your collection mm -hmm. policy need to be updated to keep, keep up with the current law. That's important. And also, you know, you want to uh, always, there's going to be special situations. You want to give the, the professional that, that you retain, the legal counsel, uh, you know, some discretion uh, in special situations. If this property doesn't have a mortgage on it, uh, are you supposed to just go ahead, do non-judicial foreclosure? Or maybe in that situation, perhaps it would be better to go the judicial route instead of, you know, you have to deal with something, a very risky situation where, you know, the, crop, the property could be sold at a very low price to a third party. And then later on, there's gonna be a dispute with the, the owner. Uh, so there are def definitely different situations. I think a, a collection usually, I mean, of course, it's, it saves money to just follow a procedure, you know, just a lot of attorneys would have paralegals do a lot of things. But really, there are situations where uh, that approach would be risky. You would want uh, the special cases to be given special attention, you know, not taking the cookie cutter approach. So um, I know when speaking to some board board members of different condos um, over the years, um, when we've gone into conversations about policies and procedures, um, what you just explained on the debt collection practice um, on the procedures, um, a lot of them don't even have it in writing. They don't even have a policy procedure manual. So um, I would think it's highly recommended um to make sure it's a written policy and procedure because it has to apply equally to everybody that procedure right 
So it really, and boards change from year to year, or they could change from year to year. So um, really one of the highly recommended is to make sure that you have a written policy and procedure that is followed um, with every single delinquency. So you're not, um, you're not, a, a, an issue can't come up that you're discriminating or you're preferring one to another. You're just following it line item by line item and being consistent with every single collection, right? Yeah, that's always a good approach. You're supposed to uniformly apply no selective enforcement. Right. Okay, so let's move on to the actual sale. So what happens when it moves to um, a foreclosure sale? What happens with that? I know um, um, the DCCA publishes it now because um, it became too expensive because we only have one newspaper. So it literally became so cost prohibitive just to publish that sale. So I, I believe the DCCA now is putting it on their website, but you kind of got to scroll all the way down to the bottom to kind of find it. Right. So <laughs> in the old days, you know, the three consecutive publications has to be done on newspaper, which is really costly. Uh, but then, you know, during the reform process, they uh, designed this uh, state website. Uh, people can post notice there. But still, you know, the 28 advance notice on the website, that's just one step. You still need to do at least one newspaper uh, you know, advertisement, you know, for the judicial process, uh, you know, a commissioner will be appointed by the court uh, to handle the, uh, you know, the auction, the, the advertisement, you know, if the sale needs to be postponed, the postponement or cancellation need to be published as well. But in a non-judicial fore foreclosure process, usually that would be the association's attorney who is the one that's going to be in charge of posting these notices and making sure uh, postponement cancellations are also timely uh, you know, posted to uh, to this website and, uh, you know, on the newspaper following the requirements, the procedure requirements. Uh, that's usually like, the, you know, right before the auction when you need to give a public, let them know when and where you should go to bid on this property. That That's like assuming all the other process we just mentioned about the mediation or, you know, the payment plan thing all didn't work. You, you have fulfilled all the requirements of serving every possible party that on the property has right entitled to notice. Then you went ahead uh, to the auction stage, to the sale, public notice, a public sale. That's what we're talking about, all these publication of notices. Okay, so after, um, I know some ALs are buying it back subject to the first mortgage. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I've seen typically it will go um, into the managing agent's rental pool. And then so they'll manage that and get their, their property management portion of that rental value. Um, but is it, is it there's their set standard that once it goes into that rental pool that they market, they um, rent it for market value? Um, should that be the standard? And how long do they keep it into that rental pool? I mean, I mean, ALs are not really in the business of being rental housing, so to speak. When do they actually try to um, dispose of that property? And what's that right. process? So usually when the association forecloses, there is a senior mortgage lien on title. So the association, when they bid at, the, at their own auction, they do credit bid maybe at a $1 because it's subject to the senior mortgage lien. You probably get no other invested. If there's no equity in the property, usually there's no other interested bidders there. Association usually ended up getting the property subject to the senior mortgage lien. And once, you know, because you really didn't ever get paid out of this kind of process because there's no sales proceeds here. You advanced all these legal fees and costs and, and you know, the, uh, the, the dues are accumulating during this process when you handle this foreclosure process. So after the association take control of the property, that's the opportunity when, you know, if you spend a little bit of money, maintain it, bring it up to a rentable condition, then you start getting rental income out of this unit. And then, you know, there's this section N in uh, section uh, in uh, 514B-146 guiding you on the, you know, rental uh, income. Of course, you know, of course, the net you get, you, you, you have to still pay, you know, either there's a rental managing agent's fee, and there's also this unit's portion of uh, association dues, and there may be, you know, uh, cleaning fees, whatever you, you have to keep this condition process. And then if there's net 
you started to pay these uh, delinquencies owed by this unit first on the six month super lien, like the six month regular common assessments. The association has a super lien for that. You paid that off and then started with the other uh, categories of balances. There's legal fees, there's late fees, there's also other maintenance fee delinquencies on the unit. Uh, if then there's extra, section A for the condo statute basically says the association is not entitled to this excess net rental income. It would be a good uh, idea for the association to keep a separate account, not mingle that portion of the money with your common money, common funds um, account. Uh, there should be a, a separate to keep track of you know, the amounts coming in because supposedly this excess rental income, uh, when the senior lien holder, they go through the foreclosure process, they got a court judgment basically saying they are the senior lien holder, then they are entitled to claim that excess rental income. And if they're paid off, there's still a surplus, and supposedly it would go through other junior lien holders if there's any judgment lien holder, which is you know a subordinate to associations lien. And then if there's any other, um, you know, of course the unit owner, if there's still money left, they will go there. But usually it wouldn't be like the situation. Usually the situation it would take a still take a while for the association to bring the book from red back to gray. They have to really rent it a long time in order to recoup their loss and make it current. And then for the surplus amount, they need to keep a separate account to keep track of that. Just be prepared one day the senior lien holder may come back to claim that. So um, <clears throat> uh, this is, a, a, I'm sorry, I, I just want to add, add, this is for the non-judicial foreclosure process. If it's a judicial foreclosure process, of course, you know, after the sale finishes, the commissioner is going to provide a report to the court, you know, uh, how the sales process needs to be distributed. The court is going to give order, then according to the priority of the liens, the you know, and then if there's surplus, it will be deposited with the court clerk. You wouldn't have to be worrying about too much about that. Uh, and then, yeah, so, and then if the association take title in that kind of situation, uh, supposedly, you know, maybe uh, you would turn over the access, access amount to, uh, to the court. Okay, so, um, so uh, it, technically for a while, the, the, that property, if it's rented out at market value, it would be generating literally in the red for a while until it starts to get back into the black. But that unit, whatever the rental income, if it's at market value would be, um, hopefully it would be generating enough income to pay the existing current maintenance fee, right? And then also being applying, applying the monies toward um, the past delinquencies. Yes, uh, yes. And also, of course, you have to, you know, buy insurance for the unit as well, like HO4. Uh, there's other, you know, you pay the rental, the rental management uh, agency, right. stuff like that. There's right. those ongoing. Yeah, right. Um, so, so literally, they, the, the, the association could not even really turn around and sell that unit because it's still subject to the first. Um, but it's whether they're going to establish clear title in order to really sell it. That's really where the word gets complicated, right? We cannot, basically, because, you know, as we just mentioned, first in time, first in right, the mortgage lien is always recorded first. So really under the statute, of course, the real property tax lien that has the, you know, number one priority. And then the next one is the senior mortgage lien. Uh, when the senior mortgage lien, they foreclose, if they fulfill all the service requirements, all the notice requirements after the lender forecloses, they're gonna wipe out all the junior liens under the law. So, but the association only get a special carve out, which is the six month super priority lien, which is this, you can only collect six month common assessments, regular common assessment from you know the new buyer who took over from the foreclosing mortgage mortgagee. Uh, but you know when a junior lien holder foreclosed first, uh, usually it's the association. You take the you know, you go ahead and foreclose. The senior lien hasn't started their foreclosure. You only get a, a property uh, with, with subject to that senior mortgage lien. The, their right is intact. You cannot make anything to have, you know, deliver clean title. That's why uh, 
you are just holding this property actually in limbo in a temporary period of time before the senior lien holder steps in uh, to foreclose on their collateral. So yeah, there's really no, no other way for the association to somehow deliver clean title, no. So what if the unit owner um, in correspondence with the commissioner or whatever, you know, um, they just get, throw their hands up and they're like, you know what, I, I can't maintain the unit, I can't make the mortgage payments, I can't pay back all my past due maintenance fees. I mean, like, like mortgage lenders, you're able to literally almost give back the keys in one, one verbiage that was, that was said. Um, but what about with, um, so what if that's presented to all the parties, all the lien holders, like, I can't, I can't do this, you know, I don't want the unit, just take it off my hands. I mean, is there a formal process for that as well? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it really depends. If, of course, if the property has equity, the best way usually is for owner to stop ownerships, put it for sale on the market, you know, get money, pay off your mortgage, and then maybe you get some money back, you know, before the lender or the association accumulate legal fees and costs, because that all ultimately will come out of your pocket. But if there's no equity, you know, if the market, the, the market is bad now, the property is underwater, that happened, you know, back in the last crisis, we saw a lot, uh, you know, then the owner would be better off to just uh, surrender. I think, you know, in a lot of other states, there's deed in lieu of foreclosure. Right. Uh, but somehow, you know, the, you know, these days, of course, there's also forbearance during the special period of time, especially during COVID. There are a lot of programs out there who can help owners, uh, you know, it really depends. If you have a lot of debt on this property, you're also worried about uh, your credit. At that point, if you're super, super underwater, you have many liens on this property already, maybe the best way is to consult with a bankruptcy attorney. You know, go through bank bankruptcy, you can shake off a lot of those junior liens, like a judgment lien. If you have a very giant judgment lien or even RS income liens, whatever, work through bankruptcy process, get debtor protection, give you a period of time uh, to, you know, you can, there is a portion, you know, maybe there are debtors who, you know, either choose the, chapter seven liquidation process or involuntarily, or, you know, they voluntarily choose a chapter 13, they could, you know, through bankruptcy, there's a five-year payment plan. They can somehow, you know, only, uh, you know, those secured creditors will pay the portion of the debt through the payment plan. All the other unsecured debt will be wiped out through the bankruptcy process. So there's definitely avenues there. That's why the whole process started with the 60 day hold. Also notice will tell debtors there are these uh, consulting services available. You can do credit counseling or you know budget counseling or even bankruptcy counseling to try to uh, put your financials into order. Think it through what makes sense for you at this point. Okay, so um, we're hitting close to our, our end time, but I also wanted to to make mention that um, Hawaiian community Hawaiian community assets. So it's it's HawaiianCouncil.org, not Hawaii Council, but HawaiianCouncil.org. They are doing homeowner assistance, and I want to say they will help up to thirty thousand, but I, I, I don't quote me on that. But um, I was going through the website, and I did refer when one person to them and, and they're, they've been tremendous in helping her um, in, in getting her stuff in order because she was, there was an auction date set for her, um, but they do have assistance to homeowners. And I believe it's not specific to just Hawaiians only that you have to have part one for them to help. They're, um, I believe it's open for anyone to seek assistance. So people should really, if they're delinquent, they should really take advantage of some of those um, monies that are still out there from COVID um, to do these assistance um, that, um, that are really, I mean, they really need to take advantage of it so that they can save their properties and, um, and get current if they're behind. Um, so any, any closing thoughts that you have? <laughs> uh I think, yeah, so for associations, I guess it's just that, uh, you know, as you said, if you ended up with that property uh, in your rental pool, you just, you know, at act according to your business judgment rule, do your best, you know, try to brand uh, the, you know, brand the account current. And once after that, for the excess net rental income, you want to be careful about the accounting and keeping a separate account for that. For owners, really uh, still, I think 
be active, you know, take timely action, work out payment plans with, uh, you know, either association or mortgages, uh, do not wait until last minute. But of course, during the, you know, foreclosure process until, you know, the, the sale convenience documents are recorded, there is a period of time you can still, if you come up with enough the money, you can pay off the debt, stop the whole process, regain your title from part party. Uh, but that that's usually like you know a lot of legal fees has been accumulated already right. like if you right. started with something small you know propose a payment plan work hard to try to avoid a further accumulation of legal fees usually you know try to tackle a smaller problem is much better than you take nothing and no action and wait and then the the legal fees is gonna jump up you know substantially making it even harder for you to try to deal with the problem down the road and right. those uh, professional counseling services are really helpful and uh, there may be some other assistant programs out there especially for owner occupant you want to you know actively seek help if you are in that kind of situation and then also right. find your own counsel represent you to uh in the foreclosure process don't just get defaulted and then do nothing right Okay, so thank you. We're nearing our end. And um, Milan, I really, really want to thank you for um, joining me today and um, going through this little tutorial on that whole foreclosure process and what ALS should be um, um, complying in with the Debt Collection Practices Act. Um, and I really appreciate um, you taking your time out of your busy day to do our Condo Insider. Um, so with that, um, so thank you, Nalan, and um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, hope to see you back again next week on another Condo Insider subject. Thank you. Thanks Thank so. you.